mid-90s, 3D gaming was in its infancy, and the sky seemed like the limit for the video game industry. Longtime franchises like The Legend of Zelda, Final Fantasy, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Super Mario were making their 3D debuts, along with the new franchises being brought to life such as Spyro the Dragon, Tomb Raider, Resident Evil, Perfect Dark, among so many others. And during the 90s, the console wars were just starting to heat up, with a new player in town in the form of Sony. From a failed partnership with Nintendo of all companies, Sony threw their hat in the ring with the PlayStation, the console that would rival the Nintendo 64, Sega Saturn, and Atari Jaguar. A new console manufacturer in the game industry created a need for a new mascot to represent Sony's game division. Nintendo had Mario, and Sega had Sonic, but before The Last of Us tugged at our heartstrings, before Nathan Drake brought us along on Uncharted Adventures, and even before Jack and Daxter teamed up to find Precursor Orbs, there was Naughty Dog's first smash hit. Crash Bandicoot. Crash Bandicoot began development in September of 1994 under the codename Willy Wombat and was released into an unsuspecting public on September 9th, 1996 to critical and commercial success, becoming the 8th best-selling PlayStation game of all time, selling over 6 million units. With said success, two sequels were spawned in the form of a follow-up in Crash Bandicoot 2, Cortex Strikes Back, and one of my favorite 3D platformers, and the best Crash Bandicoot game bar none, Crash Bandicoot 4. Crash isn't like most 3D platformers of his era. The majority of games in that genre opted for a more non-linear approach to the design of its world and movement system a la Super Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie, Sonic Adventure, Donkey Kong 64, etc, etc. Crash Bandicoot, at its core, is a very literal 3D platformer. It's in the third dimension, and you jump and platform through levels. While that might seem to be too simplistic for any lasting longevity, Crash was able to make a name for himself regardless. Crash's default moveset in Warped is unique among his competition. While he has the traditional running and jumping, Crash also utilizes some other moves that sets him apart rather well from the likes of Mario, Sonic, Banjo, and the others. Crash's iconic spin move gives players all sorts of options from breaking boxes, killing enemies with a satisfying flipping switches, and eventually gliding. It's a wonderful little move that gives Crash some of his endearing personality as the press of the square button sets his body into a blurry tornado of limbs. His second and most important move is the slide. This move is integral to why Crash is so much fun to control in Warped, combining sliding, jumping, and spinning for some impressive results, whether that's sequence breaking, or dodging, or outmaneuvering an enemy. These multifaceted mechanics are what sets Crash apart from his competition, making his PS1 days so memorable. While Crash Bandicoot's level design isn't in-depth or groundbreaking, I admire it for its focus on tough platforming challenges. Naughty Dog took on the challenge of taking 2D platformer design principles and transferring them into 3D head-on. Miyamoto and his team at Nintendo decided to completely revamp what it meant to be a Mario game with Mario 64, keeping the core principles of running and jumping, but instead of a flagpole to grab at the end of a level, or a princess to save, levels were more wide open with multiple objectives per level. Granted, this probably came about due to hardware limitations of the N64, but it was revolutionary all the same. Naughty Dog could have easily seen what Nintendo was doing with Mario and followed suit, but decided to stick to their guns with their design philosophy, and I feel it paid off. Really nothing plays like a classic Crash Bandicoot game. Modern Sonic and classic Crash are apt compared comparisons due to their similarities when it approaches level design. The former focuses on style over substance, and the latter places an emphasis on challenging platforming. Even though it's simplistic, Crash's level design is satisfying because it's streamlined and focused. Often referred to as hallway design, Crash's levels were crafted to throw as many platforming challenges at the player as possible, whether that's pits to jump over, obstacles to avoid, enemies to bounce off of, and of course, boxes to break. While they may appear to be very simplistic, it doesn't stop Warp's levels from being varied. A more dynamic camera was implemented, allowing for a smooth transition from 3D to 2D. Bonus rooms are a staple of the series, but they're done best in Warped, offering a segmented platforming challenge or a neatly designed puzzle of sorts. Level-specific mechanics like monkey bars, rising water levels, or chase sequences spice up each various locale. The narrative focus on a time-traveling adventure adds tremendous variation in the level themes, and it's a much appreciated improvement over Crash 2's abundance of sewer, jungle, and snow levels. Stages set in ancient Egypt, atop the Great Wall of China, or among dinosaurs in the Jurassic period are some of the most memorable level thematics in the series. What makes the level aesthetics work so well is just how good this game looks, even today. Let's be honest with ourselves for a moment, most early 3D games for the PlayStation, N64, or Sega Saturn are pretty... harsh 
on the eyes, to put it lightly. This doesn't take away from the overall gaming experience by any means, but it's just not very pleasing to look at. Among some games of its era, Crash Bandicoot's graphical fidelity has always stood the test of time for me. Levels are chock full of detail, in part to the way Naughty Dog designed their levels, being able to load parts of the level in as need be to achieve so many polygons on screen at once. In Crash 1 and 2, the, the maximum distance at which you could see any polygon was about 70 meters. In Crash Warp, we've opened that up to 700 and some odd meters. Animations are cartoony, with Crash having an abundance of memorable death animations, which have become a staple of the franchise of sorts. For <laughs> And even today, Crash Warped, along with its predecessors, holds up surprisingly well compared to its contemporaries. I guess Naughty Dog has always had a knack for making some truly spectacular visuals. To add more variety to a very platforming-heavy franchise, Naughty Dog chose to implement various gameplay styles to the Crash Bandicoot formula. This approach usually spells disaster for any game. Just look at Big the Cat and Sonic Adventure, for example. Maybe? What? The garbage, <laughs> man! God! But they oddly feel right at home in Crash Bandicoot Warp. From riding a jet ski during the age of the pirates, scuba diving in the ocean's depths, to racing Cortex's men in the 1950s, complete with a stylish greaser jacket, the amount of new gameplay additions is pretty staggering considering it took Naughty Dog little less than a year to develop Warped. These different gameplay styles break up the platforming levels nicely, setting a good pace for the game as a whole. While they're the minority, they're fun little challenges in their own right, while still focusing on the main objective of any Crash level, which is grabbing the iconic purple crash crystals, as well as the best feature of the entire franchise, and no, I'm not kidding, breaking boxes. Never has there been such a small feature that has genre-defining implications. Before Banjo-Kazooie came along and pioneered the collectathon genre, Crash Bandicoot had elements of this addicting mechanic that add to the challenging platforming in the form of breaking boxes. Each level has a box counter, and breaking all the boxes in the level will net players a gem for their work. Not only is this something the players will be doing constantly to collect wampa fruit or extra lives, but the gem collecting comes as a whole new layer of replayability. Breaking boxes just becomes an impulse, and hunting them down in each level is a blast. Trying to trigger TNT boxes without dying, or avoiding all the nitro crates, and hoping the level's end trigger box gets them all. The variety of boxes available to break is another important detail Naughty Dog nailed, that not only breaks up the brown monotony visually, but mechanics-wise as well. The aforementioned TNT and nitro boxes are commonplace, but there's also crates that can only be broken with a belly flop, boxes that require the player to bounce on them continuously to break, boxes that will change their contents rapidly and turn into metal if not broken fast enough, or even boxes that bounce players high up to reach other boxes or new areas, but also count towards the level's total. While Naughty Dog could have simply littered their levels with the same brown box a hundred times and called it a day, the variety added goes a long way in making the box-breaking metagame more interesting. The gems earned by breaking all the boxes in a level are a great incentive for 100% completion on top of the special colored gems that open up different routes in other levels that span the whole game. These special gems are found throughout levels or on new death routes, routes that players can access if they survive without dying up to a certain point in a level. For example, grabbing the purple gem in High Time's death route opens up a brand new part of Tomb Time and another gem. Hunting for boxes to grab as many gems as possible, or keeping an eye out for colored gems, or even surviving a death route are fantastic for the overall replayability of Warped. Alongside the various gems to collect, relics were added acting as a sort of time trial mode. Usually time trial modes are just an added timer and players try to speed run the level, but Crash adds the these time boxes that help stop time to increase your score. Get the high score, get the relic. It's a neat little twist on the established formula of break all the boxes. Slowing down to hunt for every box will kill your chance at the top of the leaderboards, but knowing when to time your jump to bounce off a time crate can mean the difference between a platinum or a gold relic. One can simply blast through warp by just focusing on the crystals and finish in about 3-4 to four hours, but I'd argue they're missing a good half of the game experience doing that. Another way Crash managed to set himself apart from other 3D platformers is its challenging nature. While it's no Sekiro, the difficulty of the Crash games makes it stand out from other, more manageable titles like Banjo or Mario. Like I mentioned in my Tropical Freeze video, the challenge comes from a combination of great level design and platforming challenges to tackle, and those levels being designed around the controls. Crash controls... Well, he controls like an early PS1 platformer. Not bad, per se, just not as good as something like Mario Odyssey. Early Crash games were designed with just a D-pad in mind, while 2 and Warped had the addition of the DualShock's analog sticks. While Crash doesn't control buttery smooth due to technical limitations of the time, the controls are very easy to settle into and work great for the levels Naughty Dog designed around them. Warped has a great sense of pace and progression as well. Crash and Coco are teleported to the Time Twister, which is a mini-hub of sorts, similar to Crash 2's Warp Room. There are five worlds, 
worlds, for lack of a better term, that players must platform through, with each world housing five levels and a boss to defeat before moving on. Similar to Super Mario 64, players can choose which levels they want to tackle in whatever order they choose, making playthroughs differ from player to player, if only slightly. It's a fantastic design choice, considering Naughty Dog paced each world with differing types of levels like I mentioned before. Most consist of the tried and true platforming Crash is known for, but sprinkled here and there might be a water level, a vehicle level, or a racing stage. While each world has a central theme, it isn't married to the idea, mixing and matching each level aesthetic as the game progresses, making each world unique while also not stretching a theme too thin. Look at Dr. N. Jen's world, for example. The main theme is an Egyptian theme, with Arabian and futuristic themed levels scattered throughout. Speaking of N. Jen, let's talk about Naughty Dog's impeccable knack for creating iconic characters. Crash Bandicoot's cast of characters, both antagonist and protagonist, are some of the best in their genre, even rivaling the likes of Sonic and Mario's side characters. Crash is a lovable doofus, but Coco is the brains of the operation, clearly. Aku Aku isn't just a neat design, but also comes in handy gameplay-wise, acting as an extra hit while tagging along with Crash, or becoming the series' invincibility power-up when collecting three masks in total. All the bosses Crash faces off against not only have great visual and attack pattern designs, but are also just likable in general. Tiny Tiger, the brood of the bunch, the mad scientists, and Nero Cortex, and Jin, Entropy, the designer of the Time Twister, and my personal favorite, Dingo Dial. Break out the butter. We're gonna make toast. There are so many likable and notable characters from Crash's first three games alone, Naughty Dog was able to make a kart racer out of the orange marsupial in the form of Crash Team Racing a mere three years later. Upgrades also add to the progression of Warped, being awarded after defeating said likable bosses. Abilities such as double jumping, an extra powerful body slam, or gliding open up the gameplay dramatically, giving players more options in the platforming department. They're implemented into the gameplay and level design pretty well, even throwing in glimpses of the Metroidvania genre, allowing players to replay previous stages with their newly acquired abilities to break boxes they couldn't before, or find new pathways in a level. It's a welcome addition to the Crash franchise, and while it would be implemented in future titles like Wrath of Cortex, it's at its best in Warped. Not everything about Warped clicks, though. While the pace and variety of levels is great, not all hit the mark, specifically the racing stages. The control is fine, but the window of for first place is narrow, and anything but will result in a no crystal and another attempt. The power-ups are a great addition, but the fruit bazooka is a bit useless and far too removed from Crash's default moveset. And even though there are some real great tracks here, Warped's soundtrack leaves much to be desired, with the instrumentation of some of the songs feeling detrimental to their overall composition. Overall, nothing too egregious enough to sour such a fantastic title. After Naughty Dog passed Crash on to other developers, he saw very little success. But after nearly a five-year hiatus, Crash made his triumphant comeback in 2017 with the Insane Trilogy, three complete remasters from the ground up of the original PS1 trilogy. While Crash 1 and 2 saw the most updates, Warped was relatively untouched and plays just as great as it did in- complete with next generation models, textures, effects, lighting, and rendering. Vicarious Visions helmed this project and did a wonderful job, reinvigorating interest in Crash once again. With this remaster trilogy doing so well sales-wise, hopefully it opens up the door for a potential follow-up to Warped. A proper Crash 4, perhaps. While it may appear simple on the outside, peeling back the layers of Crash Bandicoot Warp reveals a stellar 3D platforming adventure. While the platforming genre has been dominated by the likes of Mario and Sonic for almost a quarter of a century, there was a small sliver of time where Crash was on top. Crash put Sony on the map in terms of a formidable opponent to Nintendo, Sega, and eventually Microsoft. Naughty Dog crafted a wonderful little trilogy on the original PlayStation, capping it off with one of the best 3D platformers you can experience today.